if you came in from this direction over here, you probably noticed the Nebraska Family Alliance and voter registration table out in the lobby. And maybe that stirred some feelings in you. There are some in here that see that and they say, yes, I'm so excited to have a conversation in church about politics. Woohoo! And there are some of you in here that are like, oh, I'm so uncomfortable to have a conversation about politics. Ugh. And there are some of you in here that have like, I've never thought about having a conversation <laughs> about politics. You've never even given it a thought before. So we need to address the elephant in the room. And I'm not talking about the Republicans. I'm talking about, you see what, it, you see what I did that there? Because elephant and donkey. Anyway, we need to address this issue. Because politics can be just as divisive and difficult out there as it can be in here. This is an out there and an in here situation that we need to look at here among our church, among God's faith family. But it shouldn't have to be difficult or divisive. We shouldn't have to have this weird churning issue in it when we're talking about this in church. Because regardless of how we think about how it should be handled in here, the reality remains. There are big, difficult issues coming at us as Christians this election on November 5th. I think we all know that. We all know it's a big thing. And the elders and I believe that just because something is a hot button issue or controversial, it should not be ignored. We should be a church that is, that is able to say these are difficult things, but we can be mature and we can seek the word of the Lord and see how we should be able to walk in these things rather than just saying, let's avoid them. So the elders have asked me to, to take this task on for the next three weeks. So for the next three weeks, I'm gonna preach two sermons. Um, well, I'm doing two and then Tim will do one, but I'm gonna preach a little mini sermon each week for the next three weeks to, to lead us into the word of God. And each week, I'm going to be addressing one question. This first week, the question is this. What does the Bible say about voting? Pretty reasonable question. Next week, what does the Bible say about ballot initiatives? And then finally, what does the Bible say about selecting government leaders? These are big questions. The Bible, I think, does speak to these things. And so that's what we're going to to dig into. So the first one today, what does the Bible say about voting? Now, we could go to lots of places in the Bible, but I think the place that the best helps us to get our mind around this and to think about it well is Matthew 22. We're going to be looking at verses 15 through 22. So if you want to go there, I want to encourage that you do that. I'm going to, I'm going to read this and then we're going to talk about it. I think first we should just pray briefly because I'm going to need a ton of help because this is a difficult issue. Lord, I'm just asking, please, that you would help us to see how to talk about the tough issues. Lord, I'm asking that you would help us to have grace for one another and our different opinions about how we even talk about tough issues, let alone the issues themselves. And Lord, I'm asking that you would help me to speak your word, nothing less, nothing more, that we would see rightly what you would have for us. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to read this for us. Matthew 22, starting in verse 15. It says, then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him, that's Jesus, in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? <clears throat> But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him, and they went away. Should we pay taxes? That's what they're asking him. What if the government is evil? Should we still pay taxes? That was their question. 
That was what they wanted to trap him in. What about taxes, Jesus? Should we pay them? And Jesus' answer was, you know, you need to give to Caesar what's Caesar's, and then you need to give to God what's God's. And the way he answered that, he fully expected that God's people would do this very thing. And he knew the heart of Caesar, and yet he still said, this is what you do. And he knows all of the governments in the world, inside and out, because he is king over all of those governments. None of this is a surprise to him. None of this is out of his hands. So in that day, in Jesus' day, Caesar had a couple things. He had the census. Remember Joseph and Mary, the census. And he had taxes. Taxes belonged to Caesar's kingdom. And unfortunately, it seems that nothing has changed over the last 2,000 years, and we still have taxes, darn it. Like, come on. But that's what it is. But for us now, today, our Caesar, our government, still has taxes, still has the census, but they have a couple of things that none of the governments in Jesus' day had. Today, our Caesar, our government, still asks that we pay taxes. Our government still asks that we fill out the census stuff every 10 years. We do that. Our government asks us to serve on jury duty. And our government asks us to vote. That's what Caesar is asking us to do. So in the government that God has put us under, we're asked to give our thoughts, which, what an opportunity. We're asked to take part in communicating to our Caesar how to rule this land, how to govern us. Matthew and Mark and John and Peter and Luke and Paul, they didn't have a blessing like we have. They didn't live under that opportunity. Nonetheless, however, they would be following Jesus' instructions and how we are going to follow Jesus' instructions. Right here in this text, we are called to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to render unto God what is God's. That's the principle that Jesus taught, and I believe that principle applies to these things as well. Taxes, jury duty, census, voting, same principle. Now, if I stopped there, and this is important, let's not miss this, if I stopped there and said, just do this because Jesus said so, I would be preaching a moralistic law that wouldn't be of any real value. Just grit your teeth and do it. That, that, if we're not careful, that might be how we read this passage. That might be how we hear this. We need to stop. As gospel people, we need to ask the question, where is the gospel in this particular text? Because I believe we can find it. It's here. Because this passage is actually part of a bigger event. See, what I did is I took it a little bit out of context. Now I want to show you the whole context and what this fits in. If we take the full context, it starts at verse 15, which we read, but it doesn't end until verse 46. This is a series of events where the various religious leaders of the day are coming to Jesus and they're trying to trap him. And so they ask him a series of three questions. They kind of take turns at trying to trap Jesus. <clears throat> the first question is the one that we read. Should we pay taxes? The second question is, what do you do with a guy who had seven wives in the resurrection? Who's he married to? And the third question we're all pretty familiar with, what is the greatest law? And Jesus gives these great answers, these helpful, amazing answers that, first of all, totally blow the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees away, and second, it silences them. And these are important answers to important questions, but they're not the most important question. Because Jesus takes those three questions and he answers them and he's probably like, oh, that's cute. But then he says, now I have a question for you. And we see that in verse 41. Jesus turns this around to them and he says, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? That's the question. And that question and the answer to that question is what actually helps us understand how the gospel applies rightly to the other answers to this thing that we read. You see, because when we understand who the Christ is, whose son is he, how does that work? Then we start to discover that when we're saved by the perfect life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, we get a new citizenship. If we didn't have that, we'd just have Caesar. But we have what is Caesar's 
and what is in the kingdom of God's. We get dual citizenship. We, we suddenly start to realize there's something more. And on this note, we're now citizens of the kingdom of God, except we're asked by our king, as we're still traveling through this country on our way to the eternal city, we are asked to be ambassadors of the king and represent him. Which means while we're here, we're going to render to Caesar, as we're asked to do so, and we're going to render to God what belongs to each of those areas. And we have to come to grips with this reality. We're all kind of selfish. We're all stirring inside. But it is by the gracious gospel and the power of Jesus Christ that we are slowly being transformed a little more and a little more, and our, our wicked selfishness and our our junk inside is being transformed little by little so that as we come to the things that Caesar asks of us, we are able to recognize that we can still worship God by serving God, even though we're asked to do things of our earthly Caesar today. You can actually make these things an act of service by how you're walking and following with Jesus, serving as his ambassador. So this is an important thing. So why we want to be able to talk about it and walk through it and not just brush it off to the side or keep it outside the walls. It's important. And so maybe this morning, based on what I've said, maybe God is stirring in you a little bit to go, oh, well, I wasn't too interested in that, but maybe now I need to consider it. Maybe I need to think about it. I mean, I know some of you have been thinking about this for a long time. You're already there, but some of you aren't. Right, so we're just going to graciously say we're here to help you. That's what the table is out there for. And there's something you need to know. Maybe that's you. There's something you need to know. Caesar has put a deadline on when you have to be registered to vote. And if you're not registered to vote by October 25th, then you're not going to be able to vote on election day. So if you're feeling like God is stirring you to do this, regardless of what you're going to do in the, in the ballot box on the poll, like when you step into the, the poll, you got to think about registering. So outside on that table, there's voter registration cards, there's a bunch of information. If you want to find out a lot more about the election, there's a lot more information out there. There's a bunch of stuff out there. Or you can go to the Nebraska Family Alliance and they'll help you get started. There's a ton of stuff on that website that'll just help you. Because if we're really going to render unto Caesar as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we probably need to figure out how we're going to do that. Or if you're one of those who, who knows how to use these little QR codes, you can go to the QR code in your bulletin, and you can get started right there. Because if we're going to do what the Lord has, has asked us to do and be transformed by his gospel, we probably need to do it responsibly and do it well because that's our act of worship to the Lord as we serve in this country as we travel to our kingdom. Amen? If, um, if you have your Bible or an app you'd like to open and be following along with me, I'm going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. So if you, want to, if you want to start making your way there, that's where I will be in just a second. <clears throat> so just like last week, we have um, kind of have two things going on this morning in God's Word. Praise the Lord. Uh, the elders have asked me to speak on some matters of the election and kind of all these things that are coming at us this election season. And so last week I addressed the question, what does the Bible say about voting? And this morning I'm now taking on the second question, which is what does the Bible say about ballot measures or, or ballot initiatives? I hope you got a chance to, to, if you weren't here, if you got a chance to see the the other part online, I'm sure you can find it on the website. What does the Bible say about ballot measures? Well, first, a ballot measure, because I know there's some young people in the room maybe haven't gone to vote yet. A ballot measure is when the government wants to ask for our opinion and our thoughts on how the government should handle a particular uh, legal matter or even an amendment to the Constitution. It's Nebraska saying, hey, Nebraskans, how should we handle these things? So in other words, the government is asking you what you think about an important topic. With that in mind, let's go ahead and look at 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 17. I'm going to read through verse 21. 
<clears throat> God's Word says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us to the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In, um, in Utah, where I came from, back in 2004, there was a proposed constitutional amendment for the state that wanted to define marriage as being between one man and one woman. And as you can imagine, this was contentious. I mean, this was a big thing that was going on. And if ambassadors are people who represent the king or a nation and they speak on behalf of the king or a nation, then an ambassador for Christ speaks for Christ. And so when the state is asking, what say you, Christian ambassador of Christ, then we must speak what Christ says. That's what we do as ambassadors. And God defines marriage between being between one man and one woman. So if the Bible has something to say about the issue on a ballot measure, we should vote as a way of speaking on behalf of God. Like it's, it's that simple, right? Simple enough. But while representing God in that election was important, and it was, it was only a very, very small part of what God was asking me to do to be an ambassador for Christ on that issue in that place. See, sometime after that election, a prominent gay man in my community who was highly active in the LGBTQ movement and who held a seat on the community council where we lived, saw some of the mission work that we were doing in some of the scariest parts of our town, and he wanted to get coffee with me because he wanted to find out why in the world we were risking our lives for whatever it was we were risking our lives for. He was curious. So he knew that I was a Christian pastor. We got coffee. And after we had talked about the street ministry we we're doing, he brought up the LGBTQ marriage and lifestyle stuff. And I could have fought and I could have made excuses, which is what he expected me to do. He wanted me to do that, but I didn't. Instead, I served as an ambassador of God. That was the opportunity that was before me. I was fair. I was honest, I was calm, and I gave him an opportunity to consider what I was sharing. What I was sharing was not my opinions, but God's word. And then after honestly sharing this thing, I invited him to be reconciled to God. You know what happened? God opened his eyes, and God opened his ears, and God changed his heart and he was saved. God saved him. He was radically transformed. Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic event. One of my greatest memories, one of my favorite memories, his name's Brandon. I actually have a little card in my office because he shares his testimony all the time now. He's a great guy. One of my greatest memories was him coming up out of the baptism tank with his arms raised in total victory, coming out like praising King Jesus. Everybody just cheering for him. It was such an amazing day. Now he still has struggles. He still has temptations, but now he has the Holy Spirit. And now he has a faith family of people around him that are continuing to remind him and draw him back to the gospel. So another time, two married lesbian ladies ended up getting saved through a parachurch ministry. And they tried to go to a church to learn how to follow Jesus to sort of help navigate this whole thing. How do we how do, we do this? and the church blasted their lifestyle and chased them out of the building. And I don't know how they had the energy to try going to another church. I really don't, because they were treated so terribly. But by the grace of God, they came into the church where my family was and where we pastored. And, and I can tell you, it was not easy for us. It was a little bit of a challenge. 
but with grace and truth in love and by the power of the gospel, our church got to serve as ambassadors for Jesus to help them be reconciled to God. A lawyer helped them navigate divorce and all the entanglements they had to work through. I helped them navigate through a lot of complex issues in God's word. They joined Bible studies. The church came around them. They started serving. I can tell you that baptism Sunday was awesome. And today, both of these sisters are on fire for God like few other women that I know. They serve and they proclaim the gospel mostly back into the lifestyle they came out of. We couldn't have reached that, but they reached that. It's amazing, right? Praise the Lord. So it was good and it was right to stand for God on the 2004 ballot initiative, for sure. I don't, I don't say that we should do anything less, absolutely. But it did not even come close to ending there. Voting was important, but that was a very small part of what God was asking me to do as an ambassador. And so now here I am. Here we are again. It's, I'm in Nebraska, and there is a ballot issue that we need to look at. It's on the topic of abortion in this state. The state is asking us, how should the people of Nebraska handle and think about abortion? There are two competing initiatives on the ballot this year on the topic of abortion. 434 seeks to protect unborn children from abortions in the second and third trimester, except in the case of medical emergency, sexual assault, or incest. And then 439 seeks to make it a fundamental right to have an abortion until fetal viability without the aid of extraordinary medical measures. Now I've taken these two statements right off the ballot, right off the sample ballot. We have a stack of them, although I heard the first service pretty much decimated that table, so I might need to make copies. There should be a stack of sample ballots and a whole bunch of information from the Nebraska Family Alliance out there for you to take a look at. I encourage you to read those. If you want to do that on your phone, you can use the QR code on the back of your bulletin where you can go and get information because as Christians, we need to understand this issue, but there are a lot of people that are misrepresenting what's on these ballots and they're twisting it up and they're making it very complicated. Christians need to be honest. And we need to represent these things right, correctly. And we need to understand them. If we're going to be ambassadors for Jesus in the, at the polls, we need to understand what it is we're dealing with. So I encourage you to visit the table or visit the QR code so you can be well-informed at least as far as that goes. But... We need to remember that God has some things to say about abortion too. I think we all know this. We know this. God is the giver and the creator of life. And his creation bears his image. God has a lot to say about murder and taking life. And we should not be so quick to unknit what God has knit together in the womb. God has much to say about our sexual behavior and our sexual relationships. He speaks to seeking God and his wisdom in all of our choices. He talks about fleeing our temptations. He calls us not to murder the consequences of our sin, but to mortify our sin itself by the power of Christ's work on the cross. He speaks about taking care of orphans and seeking protection and justice for those who can't seek it for themselves. Certainly there's a lot to prayerfully consider from God's word on this topic as we serve as ambassadors. And that's what the text said. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Christ reconciled you to himself and gave you the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, you are an ambassador for Christ. God making his appeal through you. So church, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to speak for God in this upcoming election, and we should. Absolutely, we should. But that's only one important step as our service as ambassadors. Because after they count all the votes, and after all the court cases are done, and then after all the appeals are done, we're still gonna be dealing with this stuff. 
If not in our state, certainly in our nation. So church, our job is not over, not even close. Women who've had abortions may come here as visitors. Some might be in here right now. Doctors who've administered abortions might come here as visitors. Some might be in here right now. Men and women who've engaged in sexual activities outside of God's instruction, but by the grace of God were spared from an unwanted pregnancy, might come in here as visitors, and some are in here right now. There are people in our community who are thinking about getting an abortion here or traveling somewhere else. There are people in our community who've had an abortion and they're trying to make sense of it all, trying to work it out. There are young people who are coming in here, filling our classrooms downstairs or sitting in the student section that will be faced with these kinds of issues in the future that need to understand what God has to say about these things. They're working it out right now. All of this and so much more, it's here right now. We're working through this right now. What do all these people need? What do we need? Every single one of us, we need the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need our hearts to be transformed by the power of this gospel. And when God transforms our hearts, changes the way we see things and understand things by reconciling them to himself, he also gives us a ministry of reconciliation into this broken world. So Trinity Church, we have an important opportunity to represent Jesus on November 5th. And I want to encourage you certainly should do that, please. But also, let us not miss the opportunity that goes so much further beyond November 5th as that's only the first step. So may we be a church that is serious about the ministry of the gospel in the polling places and well beyond. It's almost here. We've almost made it. November 5th is you know, Tuesday. It's coming. Whew. The elders have asked me over these last three weeks to speak about what the Bible has to say about this issue of politics. And I'm, I'm going to go off script here for a minute, which is, my wife will tell you, always dangerous. Um, this was a challenge for me. And maybe it was a challenge for you. I opened when we did the first question now three weeks ago, and I said, maybe you saw the table in the the lobby, and maybe you went, oh, yuck, oh, no, or maybe you went, oh, yay, all right, and, and it became this whole political thing, and, and you're wrestling with it in one way or another, and you're trying to decide if this is good or bad, and you're not sure. Well, so here, here's what happened for me, which I think is a good thing. When the elders came to me and said, we want you to speak about what the Bible says about these political issues. It has forced me to put my theology of elections and politics out in front of all of you. And when you do that, you sort of have to dial it in and make sure you've got it right in your own mind before you step into God's pulpit and speak to his people. And so I've been wrestling with these three questions, and I think it's been really good because I believe that the Bible speaks to all aspects of life and death to God's glory. And this is one of the aspects of my life that we're dealing with in your life, and it's a pretty big deal in what we're dealing with. So the Bible must have something to speak to it. So we started with, what does the Bible say about voting? That was our first question. The second question, what does the Bible have to say about ballot initiatives when we're asked to engage in those? And now here we are with the third question. What does the Bible say about selecting our government leaders? Now, on a hot take, you might be tempted to just say it. <laughs> it, it doesn't, because the form of government we live under didn't exist in Jesus' day, and therefore, the Bible doesn't speak to it at all, sort of like, you know, speed limits in cars and, you know, that kind of thing. We could say this, but I think, much like our other two questions, I think the Bible has principles here that do speak into what we are dealing with 
even under our form of government that's different than what Jesus had in our day and time. There are biblical principles here that can inform us in our journey as we walk faithfully with the Lord. So, that being said, I think the principle that that I would like us to take a look at is found in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4 through 7. That's where I'd like us to go. And as you're making your way there, I just want to give you a little background. God's people, the Israelites, had turned their back on God. They had disobeyed God over and over and over again. And and he was gracious and patient and slow with them. And yet, as he promised, he eventually came and said, all right, enough's enough. I'm going to remove you from your land. So he raised up a conquering army, Babylon in this case, to come and take the land and take all the people and haul them off into captivity. They, the, the strategy of that day was to take all these people to a land they were not familiar with. So they hauled them back to Babylon. And this was because of their unfaithfulness. And now they're there. They're probably trying to make sense of it all. They're saying, what happened? The dust is settling. And the prophet Jeremiah, who speaks for the Lord, sent them a word. And that's where we're going to pick this up now, starting in verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, Take wives for your sons and give them to your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. God could have sent him a message that said, start a guerrilla warfare effort. Fight from within. Hold strong. Or he could have said, make every effort to escape. You don't belong there. It's a wicked and unjust government. Get out. He didn't say that at all. That was not the instruction he gave to these people. Instead, he says, listen, go ahead and build houses. Go ahead and plant a garden. What does that say? You're going to be here for a while. In fact, go ahead and have kids. And then when those kids are grown, marry off those kids to other kids and have grandkids. He's saying you need to settle in. You need to trust me. Because at God's hand, under God's control, they were there for 70 years. And he says something that I find so informative to them as they're just getting started in this exile in Babylon. I find it so fascinating as we think about where we're at in this world on our journey to the eternal city. We're just passing through. This is not our home. Not as it is. It will be in the new heavens and new earth, but not today. We're passing through. And he says this to these people who are also in exile in verse 7. He says, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Do you see what he did? He said, if it goes well for them, it'll go well for you. All right, so so in this city is where you will find your blessing, so you better be looking after the well-being of that city. That's an interesting principle, isn't it? That's a really fascinating deal because Babylon was completely wicked, completely sinful, completely anti-God. In fact, they sacked God's people and destroyed the temple and made a mockery of everything about these people and their God everything. And yet, yet, God said, that's where I'm going to put you. Now, 70 years was judgment on the people. They were in sort of a really big time out so they could get their head on straight and go, we, we need to turn back to the Lord. And yet, God still said, your well-being and your welfare is tied to the welfare of your captor's city. So trust me in this. Pray for this city. Pray for them. Seek the welfare of the city. Seek is an active word. Seek the welfare of the city. This means they couldn't just be passive. 
couldn't just sit back and do nothing. They couldn't say, you know, not my circus, not my monkeys, not my thing. They couldn't just sit back and put their feet up and just say, I'm just going to watch it all burn to the ground. I'm out. God commanded them to seek ways, to look for, to actively find ways to do good to the city, to bless the city, even this wicked and wretched place where God had put them. Seek ways to be a blessing. And so now we're not in the same exact circumstances as the Israelites were. We're not in here as captives in this land. But still, this land is not our ultimate home. We're just passing through. And so I think the principle remains true for us. God's people seek the welfare of the city where God has placed them. That's what he's asking us to do. Now, there's lots of ways to seek the well-being and the welfare of the cities where we live. Now, some of you I recognize, you think you get a free pass because you live a million miles outside of town. I've gone to some of your houses. Like, hey, nah, psh, God put me in the country. Now, I, think, I think you need to look after the well-being of maybe the city that's closest to you and your neighbors up and down these, these long, straight roads. And I think God wants us to look after the well-being of our county and after the well-being of our state, and after the, the well-being of our nation. I don't think anybody here gets a free pass. This principle should be ringing true in our ears as we're looking for ways to bless our city and as we're being asked to select our government leaders. I think this principle should be in the back of our mind. We should say, which leaders on this ballot are going to be best for the welfare of my community, of my city, and of my county, and, and of my state, and of the nation, which of these individuals will be a blessing to this place? We need to probably be thinking about that. Who's going to manage well? Who's going to manage best? Who's going to do what's best for the city? Now, I've chatted with people over the years. I've been involved in politics. I did my undergraduate in politics. I, I find it interesting, and I like to have conversations, but maybe not the same conversations you like to have. I'm always curious about the process. I've talked to a lot of people who go and vote and they have absolutely no idea who's on the ballot for almost any of the offices that are up for election. Okay, sure, they get the national one because of all the commercials, because it interrupts all our entertainment on our screens, and, you know, I get it. Or because it's on talk radio, or because it's the talk of the town, and everybody's talking about that. Or maybe a state race, maybe. Maybe a Senate race. Maybe something that's got everybody's attention. But for the most part, they have no idea who's running for various city council slots, um, the retention of judges, things in the county, school boards. No clue. No clue at all. So they walk in to vote, and what do they do? What do we do? Maybe you've done this. We flip a coin. We just go after a name that sounds like something that sounds nice. That guy's got a cool name. I'll go with that. I mean, what do we do? So here's the problem. Is flipping a coin actively seeking the welfare of our community? Actively saying I'm doing my part to understand how to look after what's best for my community? I don't think it is. I really don't think it is. So here, here's what we've done. I want to be able to help all of us live out these principles of the Bible that we would know live and proclaim the gospel. So this is the live part to help you live this out if you want to. If you're going to go to vote and, you know, we hope you do. If you're going to do that, there are sample ballots. I printed the whole bundle that I got from the courthouse here in Phelps County. It's the sample ballot that we'll look at. You're going to need to figure out, I mean, it's got some of the races that won't be your races, but it's got our community seats that are being selected. Go out and take a look at it. Do a little bit of work before. Be prepared so that you can seek the well-being of a city. Find out who these people are who are looking to manage and run our communities. I think, I think if we're going to follow this, we need to do that. You know, I was surprised when I, when I got the sample ballot and I started looking over it. Do you know how many local races only have one person running? It's not even an election. It's just one person. And at first I thought, well, maybe that's because, you know, all these people in Nebraska are so intimidating, they run off all the competition or something. But then I saw 
City Council Ward 1 here in Holdridge. You know when people are running for that race? None. None. Some of you live in Ward 1. And you should be terrified because we've all conspired to write your name in the line and then you're going to have to do the job. I'm just, <laughs> I don't think that's how it works, but, but whatever. We should be so grateful for the people who've been willing to come and manage our community and do the hard work that's there. And hopefully they're going to be looking after the well-being of the city. Hopefully they're, they're good people that would do well in this community. But we need to pray for them because that's what this text also said. Pray for these people. It must be a hard job if nobody wants to do it. And if you live in, you know, City Council Ward 1, maybe we should stand up and say, hey, put my name in there. I'll do the job. I don't know. We need to be thankful for the people who are doing this hard work in our local communities and in our local races. And we need to figure out who's going to do well in these other races where there are a number of people that we need to select some from. We need to look after the well-being of our community. But listen, it's not just about our immediate physical well-being. There was a lot more going on here with uh, God and the Israelites. There's a lot more going on here with us. It's much bigger than just this physical thing. Jeremiah 29, where we were just reading, if we were to look at 11 through 13, just a little bit further down from where we read, it gives us a glimpse of how. This is the how the exile in Babylon was going to be good for the Israelites. It was how God was working. It was how he was shaping them. It was sort of the why this whole exile itself. It says this, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare. There's that word again. And not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. This whole thing was something that was so much better than what they could have had physically. It was that they would have God. Having God following Jesus is the better welfare. Walking in his ways, having salvation, that's the better thing. That's the best welfare and well-being we can have. And that's what God was seeking for them. And you know what? The New Testament picks up this idea and it carries it forward even to us. Acts 17, 26 through 27 says this, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. God chose where we live so that we would know God and that people would find him. And maybe he put you where he put you so that you could help others to feel their way to God. Or maybe he put you where he put you so that you might reach out from your blind state and find God. We're passing through here. We've been put here for a purpose. And as we seek after the well-being of the city, we should be seeking after this bigger well-being. So Christians, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to think about these three questions that we've looked at and these principles as you think about your your ballot, or as you even consider if you're going to vote or not. Election is but one more way to seek the welfare of our city and our state and our nation. And maybe, I'm just maybe, God might take all of this when it's all said and done, no matter what happens next Tuesday and after that and all the courts and all the other stuff that's probably going to happen. After all that, God may use that to draw people to himself. Amen to change their citizenship from here to a citizen of the eternal city for God's glory. Let's pray. Lord.